Okay, so good morning and um, welcome to this virtual talk. Um, I know this is a bit different to what you normally have, but I hope that you enjoy it and find it interesting. Um, my name is Jane Arnold and I'm going to be talking about Pipe Green and the Pipe Green Trust and what it tells us about the history of Beacon Street and also a bit about Stafford Road. Now, why am I giving this talk? Well, I've been a member of the Pipe Green Trust for a number of years, about 15 years. I live in Beacon Street, have done so for about 20 odd years now, and I've become a very active member of the Pipe Green Trust. I am in fact what is known as the pinner of the Pipe Green Trust, and I'll talk a bit more about that role later on in the talk. Now, for a number of years, I've been quite interested in the history of the Pipe Green Trust. Not only am I active in sort of the management of the Pipe Green Trust, or Pipe Green, but also um, I've been quite interested in the history of the Trust and have spent quite a lot of time in the Litchfield Record Office before it shut, um, looking at some of the documents associated with the history of, of the Trust, the formation of the Trust and other, the accounts, books, etc. And so what I'm doing today is sharing some of this knowledge with you today, um, some of the things that I've found out through this work going through the records. And whilst it's still an ongoing project, um, I hope that you enjoy some of the things that I've managed to find out. So first of all, I'm going to be talking a bit about what the Pipe Green Trust means to us today, um, and then move on to talk about the history of the Green, and the trust and how it was formed and then talk also about some of the people that were some of the original members of the Pipe Green Trust. Okay so just to orientate you um, here we have a, a map of where Pipe Green is. So Pipe Green is this orange area here. Um, it's on just off the Western Bypass and so, to, so here we've got the um, Bowling Green pub down here, we've got the Hedgehog pub up here and it's easily accessible either by foot, so you can walk across Beacon Park, um, across the footpaths there, onto the green, or you can also, there's a little car park over here, this dotted line here, that's a little car park where you can park your car and then walk across the football fields and onto the green. There's three access points onto the green, so the one is, um, as, de as shown here, um, on this side, so probably the most used Entry, entry onto the green. Um, we also have an entry point from Abnors Lane. Um, this isn't so well used mainly because the, um, there isn't any parking at the end of, of the green and so people, there's many pedestrians, people walking the heart of England way, so this diamond shaped, um, these diamond shapes indicate this is the heart of England way that crosses the green. So not often it's just people walking the heart of England way that uses um, Abnors Lane entrance. The third entry or exit point of the green is over here, what I call the back of the green, um, which then leads onto the track that goes past some um, of the fishing ponds and Lemonsley cottages, and Lemonsley House is, is here. So you can actually do a really nice circular walk, should you so wish to do, where you can sort of come either across from Litchfield, across, across onto the green, then we'll walk across the green, out the back of the gate, and then along the track you can either go around sloppy woods if you want to. The bluebells, by the way, um, look very are very worthwhile going to, particularly, well, they usually open in early May. Um, so they're worth a bit of a detour to go and see, should you want to go and see the bluebells. And then you can just either come back through Christchurch Lane, back along the track here, to to the green or wherever. So quite a nice sort of hour, hour and a half circular walk that you can do. So I think one of the lovely things about the green are the is the views that you get from, from the green looking back to Litchfield. You get a fantastic view of the cathedral and in fact from some angles, although not shown in this photograph, you can actually see the spires of St Mary's as well as St Michael's. So you can actually see all the five spires of Litchfield from some, some angles of the green. And particularly in sort of summer when the leaves are on the trees, you don't really see any of the buildings um, 
before in front of the cathedral so you get this sort of lovely sort of almost timeless aspect of the cathedral looking across the meadow land looking across to to the cathedral spires without seeing any of the of the modern buildings and as a result it has a really tranquil um, feel to it um, and as well I was well I love going over there and um, feeling very much uh, away I'll get a bit of a feeling of being away from it all we also have um, Lemonsley Brook going across the green, um, quite an important water source. It starts off in the Jubilee Woods up at the um, Woodland Trust and then comes down through the Maple Hayes Estate, across the green um, and then into Beacon Park and then finally into Stoke Pool. It's very important for, from the Greens perspective in terms of the ecology. We have different habitats associated with the stream being there. so. So from an ecological point of view, it's important. And also, as we'll see later on in the talk, also from a recreational um, point of view, the stream has also been a big attraction for people wanting to sort of go for have paddlings and picnics and everything um, by the brook. So what are we doing about the pipe green today? I mean, how does the trust work in, in, to, in, the, in today's um, concept? So what we, the trust is involved in, is the management and the, and the conservation and the biodiversity. So improving the conservation or managing the, the green for conservation purposes and to try and increase its biodiversity. It is a site of biological importance and it has been for the last 15 years under a stewardship scheme, what we call the countryside stewardship schemes, which are run by Natural England. Um, the green has been under what's called a higher level stewardship. Um, so basically we get funding from Natural England to maintain the green as a meadowland habitat. It is, the meadowland is a important habitat in the reason why, and it's because it's fast disappearing one, unfortunately, 97% of meadowland has been lost since World War II, which is a rather hor horrendous figure. So there are a lot of initiatives to try and improve our, the meadowland across the country. So there's a lot of initiatives over the last few years to try and restore meadowland or to improve areas that already are meadowland to, to um, try and reinstate this rough or fairly fastly disappearing habitat. So that's really what the aim of the Trust is today, to conserve this meadowland habitat um, for the future. It is also very much a recreational area. Uh, many people, local residents, use it for going for a walk, using it for dog walking. Myself, I'm over there probably at least once a day with my dogs walking over there. So yeah, it's very important also for the for the residents of Litchfield to enjoy for recreational purposes. And we'll see later on in the talk. This has often been the, this has always been the case that it has been an important recreational area um, for quite a quite a long time. And just to show you some of the um, the habitats that we've got on the green. So here we have the meadowland looking like this in um, early May, where we have a preponderance of pignut. So this is the white flowers pignut, surrounded by a lot of buttercup and then these meadow grasses. So this is typically what you'd see on the green in early May. We are also fortunate on the green to have a number of orchid species. So we have... Um, here we've got a common spotted orchid that grows mainly down the Abnels Lane end of the green. So a few clumps of that growing and fortunately also are, are starting to spread as well, which is quite nice to see. We also have then southern marsh orchids. These are in various parts of the green, quite like the damper, as, uh, damper parts of the green. So um, can be found sort of in, in a bit of a boggier side, um, but quite lovely heads on them and lovely flowers associated with them. And of course we have our, our lovely bee orchid. Um, not so many of these species unfortunately. Probably we get about 12 species a year on the green. They have these stunning flowers um, but they are in fact quite difficult to find. They're, they're very delicate they're much, and I think they're a lot smaller than people think they are. And they have this habit of blending in into the background vegetation very easily. So they're not the easiest plants to see, despite having these stunning flowers. Um, as I say, they do tend to blend in very well with the surrounding vegetation. But yeah, these are very highly prized um, species and we try and look after them as much as we can. 
Another um, species that's important to the green is this thing here. It's uh, called an adatung fern. So called because this um, bit here is supposed to look like an adder's tongue. I might need a bit of imagination on that bit. Um, it's very small, it's green, and it blends in very well with the grasses and the vegetation around it. So it is actually quite difficult to see. Um, it grows in certain areas of the green, particularly on the Abnels Lane end. Um, but I say it can be very, very difficult to, to find um, unless you really know where, where it is, where it grows. Um, but say so this is something that all the ecology people get very excited about when they come to visit the green. It's a species that is indicative of um, meadowland, of ancient meadowland, undisturbed meadowland. And so say so the ecology people that come and do the surveys for us get very excited, not only that it's present on the green, but also that it's present in quite a high level on the green. So in some of the areas we've got quite a lot of this added tongue fern. So I know it's small and I know it's very inconspicuous but actually it is one of our prize specimens. Now also all this all, um, plants and flowers and everything supports then supports the um, invertebrates and the green again has a number of invertebrate species. Probably the most noticeable are the butterflies that you can see flitting around in the summer months. And here we have a lovely picture of a orange tip butterfly feeding on some ladies smock or, or cuckoo flower that um, flowers in, in May time. So we have then a raft of invertebrates on the green, butterf including butterflies, but also things like dragonflies and all sorts of other, other things, which then support the bird life that is in and around the green. And we have over 100 species recorded. Um, to be in and on the on the green and in the surrounding areas um, and Bob Russon who some of you may may have know um, he was very much involved in recording the species bird species on the green and in Lemonsley Woods as well for that matter but anyway he's he um, had very good records of the bird life on the green as I said we know that we have at least a hundred species have been recorded in and around the green. And here we've got this rather lovely picture that he took of this um, endearing long-tailed tit which can be seen and heard in the hedgerows um, on the green. They flit around quite a lot on those hedgerows. In fact the hedgerows are very good for seeing some of the birds like green finch, goldfinch, they're often in those in the hedgerows on, on around the green. Another species that we have what we see that is um, in quite a Ple pleasing to have on the green is these wax cap fungi. These can be seen in the autumn, so we're looking here about October time. The green has a number of different wax cap fungi. They are not rare, but they are good to have, they're a good species to have um, growing. They are associated with meadowland, so because the meadowland is disappearing across the country and the county for that matter, um, having them. On the, having a meadowland habitat with these species is, is a, you know, a good tick point as far as biodiversity and ecological terms go. They come in all shapes and sizes, so here we've got some lovely red ones. They're not very big, so here we're looking at maybe about um, an inch across maximum, um, sometimes they're even a little bit smaller. So these are quite small, so you have to look quite carefully for them, but once you find them they are actually rather lovely. So we get red ones, there's white ones, there's yellow ones, and we have also green ones. These are a bit more slimy looking, as you can see from, from this picture here. So again, a species representing um, undisturbed meadowland. Um, again, again, something which we're very pleased to have a number of these wax cap fungi growing on the green. Now, in order to maintain all of this habitat, these are the things that do the most of the hard work for us. So every um, summer we have a herd of about 12 to 16 head of cattle that come onto the green and graze it for us. And it's very, very important that these cattle come onto the green um, because what they're doing is they're, they're grazing the grasses down. So they're stopping the grasses becoming too dominant. And by doing that, then it allows the wildlife flowers and everything to proliferate. So these cattle are very, very important in our management plan, um, grazing the green and keeping the habitat as it is as we see it today. And as we'll see in, in, a, in a few slides time, 
Cattle have been grazing the green at least for a good couple of hundred years and have shaped the landscape accordingly. And so every year they come on, usually at the end of May um, to end of October, maybe early October. And not everyone's always that keen to have the cattle on the green, but I, th I think they're rather lovely. They're usually quite curious. They will come up and say hello to you, but um, they're not aggressive in any way. And um, on the whole, if you leave them alone, they'll they'll sort of keep much to themselves. And as I say, they're so important in in grazing the in the land in the grasses that um, you know it's something we have to have on the green every year. And it's a vital part of our management plan. Okay, so hopefully that's given you a little bit of a uh, feel about what the Pipe Green Trust does today and what the green is being, how the green is being looked after. So what I want to do now is go back and look at what we know about the history of the trust and the history of Pipe Green. So the first thing is, and something that we often get asked is, well, how did the how did the Pipe Green Trust come to be owned by the residents of Beacon Street? Um, so this was what, um, well, the answer is we don't really know. Um, what we do know is um, this quotation from the Thomas Lomax book where the land was bequeathed to the poor widows of Bacon Street, as Bacon Street was then called, by an unknown benefactor as pasture for their geese and livestock. And we know that um, the residents of Bacon Street owned Pipe Green um, most certainly in the 1790s, and in documents in the 1790s, they talk about owning Pipe Green since time immemorial. So even in the 1790s, it had been in the hands of Beacon Street residents for, uh, well, at least 100 years, probably, if not longer. Who the benefactor was, we don't really know. Um, there are num there are There is some circumstantial evidence that it might have come from the... Um, lands up at Pipe Hall from, from the estate up there. Um, but there's no written, we don't have any written document saying who the person was or where, even when it was given. So that's still a bit of a mystery, something I'd like to try and do a bit more digging around and see if I can find something out a bit more about that. But what we do know is that in 1793, um, the residents of Beacon Street decided to form the Pipe Green Trust. And in order to become a member of the Pipe Green Trust, you had to be a house owner of Beacon Street. And that's quite an important distinction. You couldn't just be living in Beacon Street or be a lodger or renting a house in Beacon Street. You actually had to own the property. So you had to be a house owner of Beacon Street or you had to be born in Beacon Street. And the document then that sets up the Pipe Green Trust, um, we, there is the original document, so it was in Litchfield Record Office now sitting in Stafford, but we do have a, a copy of it, um, which is it's not a long document, it's a couple of pages long, that's all. And I think this first paragraph here is quite telling, it sort of explains why the residents of Beacon Street actually wanted to take control of the land, Pipe Green. So it says here, whereas the land called Pipe Green hath been unjustly trespassed upon by some, and the pasture too overstocked by others, and the draining and improving the ground neglected by all. So in other words, they're saying that the land has been um, too overgrazed, it's not in particularly good shape, um, it needs draining, it's obviously quite wet again, you, that's always draining is always an issue we've had with the green, um, and basically it's not been well looked after. And they say, under such circumstance it is presumed that every person who has the least regard to justice and equity will think it highly necessary that some proper restriction should be adopted. So here they're saying, you know, then that they need to control the number of cattle grazing the green and who grazes grazes who's allowed to graze that land and then the document then goes on to cite the regulations and the rules and regulations um, that the trust has adopted which I'll talk about um, in a little bit in the next slide or so um, I won't go through the whole document um, but what is quite interesting at the end is there are the witness the signatures of the people who were the original members of the Pipe Green Trust. So their signatures are then at the bottom of the document. 
So what the document says then, in summary, I've just summarised some of the main points of it, it's fairly straightforward, is that if you were a member of the trust, you were then eligible to graze two head of cattle, and for that you paid a price of three shillings and sixpence per head. About 20 years later, so early 1800s, or, yeah, they allowed horses to be um, grazed on the green as well. So you could then, um, in the 1800s, you could actually graze two horses maximum. Um, they were more expensive, so you paid 10 shillings per horse, which then also rose to about a guinea in then sort of the mid-1800s. So horses were always more expensive to graze than cattle. And you could graze, say, one head of cattle and one horse, or two head of cattle, no horses, or two horses. So that was what you were limited to. There was a committee that was appointed that contained the chairman, treasurer, the pinner, um, we'll say which we'll talk about a bit later on. Um, an inspector was also appointed, but that that position sort of fell away quite early on in the in the trusts. And the grazing was um, allowed from the 1st of May to October. So this is the time that we um, graze the green these days. So from May to October is the window in where cattle are allowed onto the green and can graze it. And also then it gives the winter and the early spring then for the grasses and that to recover and to give enough food for the animals to graze the following year. Now of the money that was raised, half of it went to improve the green and improving the green that involved draining it. In the early years they spent quite a lot of money um, trying to drain the green to improve the, the, the drainage, making it a lot drier than it was. Um, improving the soil so there was a little bit of fertiliser being added and also seeds were added so presumably things like clover as well. Um, to help improve sort of nitrogen fixing and things like that. So quite a bit of money, so improving the green for grazing so that the cattle would be able to um, live for those six months on the green. The other half of the money was donated to the poor, I've put in here widows, brackets of widows of Beacon Street at Christmas. So initially it seemed to be that the widows of Beacon Street were the only ones that were given um, a donation. Later on in the history, it seems like other people, maybe people, more needy people, also were included. And even in some years, it seemed to be like loads of people actually um, were given the donation. So initially, the intention was it would just be the poor widows of Beacon Street that received a donation. And it was given on Christmas Eve by the um, church warden of St Chad's. So that was the, um, the money that they received by the church warden on Christmas Eve. And looking at the records, we are quite lucky in that not only do we have sort of the original documents setting up the trust in the record office, but also the accounts books. And the accounts books are quite clear in that they list everybody, the name of everybody who was gra grazing cattle on the green or horses on the green, and also the names of the people who are receiving donations. So this gives us quite a nice handle in trying to see a who, a who these people were um, and then from that maybe trying to find out a little bit more about them what they did etc so there's quite a lot of information and in those account books listing say the names of all these people and also allowing us to know how the green how much the green was being grazed and how many cattle to horses etc were being grazed and it was quite interesting in that, um, particularly sort of at least up to the mid 18th, 1800s, um, nine, about 30 head of cattle were being grazed per annum on the green, which is actually quite a lot. I mean, these days we graze between 12 to 16 head of cattle, um, which obviously is a lot less than they were grazing um, in the 1800s. Admittedly, the cattle may have been smaller, they may have been hardier, they may have been a sort of stockier breed, a bit more like the Dexters that we have. Um, so they might not have been as big as the cattle we graze at the, at, in the present day. Nevertheless, it's still, it's still quite, a, quite a number of, of cattle to have on that area of the green. Also, approximately around about six horses a year were grazed. grazed. Um, we know that uh, Dr Trevor Jones, who was who took over the um, practice of Erasmus Darwin. So he took over from Erasmus Darwin when he retired. He was grazing one and sometimes two horses a year on the green. He was a member of the trust 
and um, he was grazing a couple of his horses each year on the green, which is quite interesting. So that sort of was really how, how the green operated in the sort of 19th century. But then going into the 20th century, especially after the First World War, there was less demand for cattle being grazed on the, on the green. And so the land was rented to a local farmer, um, William Gallimore or Bill Gallimore, which I'll talk about in a bit more detail later on in this talk. And that carried on then pretty much until the 1980s, where the emphasis then changed into managing the green for conservation purposes rather than for having a herd of cattle. Um, so the emphasis then changed, so like what do we need to do to conserve the green? Um, and when, this is where all the stewardship schemes came into operation. And yes, we still do graze the green with cattle, but they're not the main reason why the cattle, why the green is being grazed. It's being raised because it's part of the maintenance of the meadowland habitat. OK, so that's given an idea then a bit about the rules and the regulations um, surrounding the start of the, of the trust. I've also spent quite a bit of time looking at the um, signatures and the names of the people that were witnesses and the original members of the Pipe Green Trust. So these are the names of the people that are on the end of that document. Um, with us. and there are 39 signatures and what's quite interesting is that 13 of them have these crosses next to their names indicating that they weren't able to read or write so basically somebody would sign the name or, or, or write their name for them and they would then come along and just put a cross next to their name um, witnessing so in other words they're witnessing that that is their signature so, so that's quite interesting, that's sort of 39 people there, of which 13 were unable to read and write. And even if, if you look at the, the writing of the signatures as well, you can see there's quite a range of um, different different types of signatures. So here we've got John Fletcher at the top, he's a, his is a bit, sh bit shaky. George Adams at the bottom here, his is a quite a confident, sort of a uh, quite almost... Um, yeah, very confident signature, I'd say there. This William Grimley here, this is very neat writing. Um, so yeah, he sort of try and sort of gauges maybe a little bit about the people just even from their from their signatures. And what I've been trying to do is look at um, in in the records and also through other other history websites, etc., to try and find out a little bit more about who some of these people were. I mean, they're not just signatures on a bit of paper. Actually, who these people were, what did they do, um, where did they live, all that kind of thing. And as you can imagine, that's quite a large undertaking and can be quite frustrating and, and very, very time consuming. So what I've tried to do then is, is look and see who were some of these original members, where did they live and what did they do. And I've chosen three. You'll be pleased to hear I'm not going to do all 39. <laughs> we could be here for quite a long time if I did that. Um, but it's sort of three members of the of the trust or involved in or receiving donations from the trust that I've picked out, which I think show the different um, wealth and also lifestyles of the people living in Beacon Street at that time. So it shows that Beacon Street was actually quite a diverse street to be living in at the early 1800s. So the first person I've chosen is George Adams. So his is his signature at the, who was at the bottom of that page. It's a quite a confident um, signature, quite almost flamboyant, I think, in a way. Um, he died in 1805. He was a wine merchant, so he's one of the wine merchants of Beacon Street. And whilst you may or may not have heard of him, you'll certainly recognise where he lived. And this was where he lived for, for much of his life. So this was at the time known as Number 3 Beacon Street, or as we now know it as the Angelcroft, beautifully restored by Friel Homes. And I think we're all very much relieved to see it in, this, in the state it is now compared to what it used to look like and sort of bringing it back to how it would have looked like when George Adams was living there. It may have been built on the site of the Talbot, and there's a bit of confusion of, as to what was the, exist, the building that it was built on. Some say it's the Angel Inn, others people say it's the Talbot Inn. So there's a little bit of confusion what it was built on. Um, but nevertheless, it's now been restored to its former glory. And something that um, 
is quite telling, I suppose, is, is only when I took this photograph did I actually appreciate that on the gates of the um in, of the of this building are these what I think are wine goblets. If we go in a bit of a zoom on this, we can see on these these restored gates that we have these what looked to me very much like wine goblets and given that George Adams was a wine merchant it would make perfect sense that he was advertising his business on the front of his gate and it may even be that these here may also be representing vine leaves as well so it's only when I sort of looked at the photograph that I actually saw these um, goblets you know I mean goodness knows how many times I've walked past the, this um, <clears throat> along Beacon Street but um, it's only when you sort of look at the photograph to actually appreciate that I thought oh gosh you know what these, these are wine goblets we've got here and then a little bit close, closer up again again you can definitely see that these are wine goblets again George advertising his business he wasn't the only wine merchant in Beacon Street at the time the Garrick brothers also had a wine business wine merchant business so it sort of goes to show that there was a demand for wine and their produce that these guys were selling um, at, in Beacon Street and at that in, in, and in Litchfield generally. So um, yeah, so two wine merchants, in quite you no, know, selling quite close to each other, um, being able to be have their own um, business. Now, whilst George was um, living at the Angel Croft or Number Three Beacon Street, he was having um, another house being built, an even bigger and better house obviously indicating that the wine business was very lucrative and the house he was having built is shown in here so this is where he moved to in about 1795-1796 um, so he wasn't actually a member of the Pipe Green Trust for that long only a few years um, before he moved up to this very nice house very big house um, with his parkland estate um, for, for really for his last 10 years of his life you may recognise it, you may not. It doesn't really look like it now. It's still standing, but it is in fact the Maple Hayes House, which is now the dyslexic school. And the bit that um, George Adams built was the main bit here. So this was a part of the house that um, George Adams had built. It was on built on the site of an old farmhouse. So he built this rather plush and luxurious house um, on other Maple Hayes. The wings here um, were built, added on by the Worthington family in the late 1800s. So these were added on later on. So this would have been the main part of the building that George was living in. And it shows, goes to show that, you know, the wine business must have been pretty lucrative for him to have not only lived in the Angelcroft, that house which in itself is a beautiful house, but was also able at the same time to afford to build an even bigger house, an even posher house, um, on the top of the hill where the maple haze is where this is now um, and you also get the feeling then that George was trying to sort of be a gentleman you know he was trying to maybe I say I'm not a wine merchant I'm more of a gentleman I've got this sort of country house now I'm trying to keep up with the gentry I'm keeping up with the Joneses and that type of thing I sort of get, get the feel from him that he was trying to live in a be more of a gentleman rather than maybe a wine merchant so that's George. Um, so there's his signature down here. Another person then maybe comparing, um, certainly a different different type of character I'd have thought, which is this um, Thomas Bonnell or Bonnell. I'm not quite sure how you pronounce it. It's Bonnell or Bonnell. Um, his name is here on the document. He can read and write. Interestingly, he's got a brother here as well, Joseph Bonnell or Bonnell. Um, who can't read and write so here he's got a cross by his name so Joseph's got a cross by his name he can't read and write yet his brother can so that's in itself is quite interesting they were um, from a family of joiners and carpenters their father Thomas also called Thomas um, came from Farewell um, so they moved into Litchfield I think sort of the latter end of the 18th century um, and became joiners and carpenters of Litchfield and in the 1810 Gazette, um, Joseph in, and Thomas are shown to be joiners and builders of Litchfield. So in the entry for Beacon Street, they are joiners and builders of Litchfield. And that's around about 1810. And they were members of the Pipe Green Trust. I say they were originally on the, on the original document as members. And they retained their membership 
um, until they died. In fact, Thomas's son, also called Thomas, um, also became a member of the trust. And I think even his son, also called Thomas, became a member. So, um, yeah, they were quite lived on Beacon Street for a good hundred years or so um, and were always members of the Pipe Green Trust. And Thomas and his brother were regularly grazing at least one head of cattle on the green, sometimes some years two. Um, and so say so they're also involved in sort of some of the work parties and some of the maintenance of the green that was being done. And I've managed to um, get to look at the will of Thomas Burnell. Um, quite a short will, but within it he leaves all his household goods and furniture, etc. to his wife, Sarah. And in his will, it states the estate is worth £450, which doesn't sound a huge amount, but when you sort of translate that into modern day money, that's going to be worth about £42,000. So quite a bit, no, quite a substantial amount of money left to his wife. Um, he So obviously he was a tradesman, a carpenter, um, builder, a good tradesman. He was able to save some money. Um, throughout his life, say, which he could then leave to his wife on his on his death. So again, a very different person than to George, who was a sort of more affluent um, wine merchant. Here we've got Thomas, a tradesman, craftsman, um, doing his the, his carpentry and building work um, and leaving still, but still being able to leave some money to, to his wife on his death. And then the third person that I want to talk about very briefly, um, mainly because I don't know much about her, is this lady called Elizabeth Allen. She wasn't a member of the trust, but she was receiving donations um, from the from the trust. So she was one of these poor widows of Beacon Street who were receiving a donation from the trust um, via the church wardens on Christmas Eve. And she was getting around about two shillings, which again doesn't sound a lot, but I think that would equate to around about £10 in, in modern day money. But what intrigued me about her was that she's recorded always as being blind. So on the records that we have, she's always written as Elizabeth Allen blind, um, which makes, it makes you sort of wonder how did she cope with um, living sort of the, in the late 18, 1700s at least, um, being blind and was she born blind or did she go blind did she have cataracts which today you know could easily be resolved by modern medicine you know you just sort of wonder you know what what did this blindness entail and she may well have been something i'd like to try and find out a resident of millie's hospital um this would have been the type of place where um you know, more of a vulnerable woman would have stayed and, and I think Elizabeth probably would have fallen into that category of being maybe a bit more vulnerable and she may well have been a resident of Millie's Hospital on Beacon Street. Again that's something I need to try and find out to see if their records show whether she was a resident or not. So again yeah a very different person to our George and even from our Thomas um, Elizabeth say on her own blind maybe being supported by living in Millie's Hospital. Right, so that's sort of three of the um, people that were early on um, members or involved or getting donations from the trust early on in its history. There's just some one other character I just want to talk about um, who was a bit later. So here we're talking about a chap called Samuel Cullick, who um, was lived 1817 to 1881, and he was chairman of the Pipe Green Trust, involved in the trust for a good, well, almost 20 odd years, 22 years. Um, from 1858 <clears throat> to 1880, so pretty much a year before he died, he was chairman of the Pipe Green Trust. His gravestone is in St Chad's, Chad's um, churchyard. It's if you go in through the gate, it's under by the yew tree on the right hand side is where his gravestone is, and it says to the memory of Samuel Cullick, vicar choral of Litchfield Cathedral and for 14 years church warden of this parish and he died in 1881 at the age of 64. He's also his wife is buried Rebecca's buried with him she died slightly later 1893 and also his daughter's eldest daughter Sarah Jane um, who died in 1911 so all three of them are buried um, together and he was one of the members of the Vicar Choral, and I say he's also one of the church wardens um, of St Chad's. 
And I actually think this tombstone's actually got a little bit wrong because what I think it should say is sacred to the memory of Samuel Culloch, chairman of the Pipe Green Trust, first of all, then he's Vicar Coral, and then he's a church warden. So I think I think he they, they got it a bit wrong. They didn't mention it, he was also chairman of the Pipe Green Trust. But what do we know about Samuel? We know a little bit about Samuel. He was um, part of the Vicar's Choral. So in other words, he was a layman, but he was part of the Litchfield Cathedral Choir. And we know he had a very good tenor voice. So he was a tenor within the choir. And he may well, in his early years, have stayed um, in the Vicar's Close, which is this lovely little close just off the Cathedral Close, um, where members of the Vicar's Choral used to live and, and well still do live. Um, so... Uh, so and do still live, still do live there in the in the vicar's close. Lovely little heiress hidden part of that cathedral close, I think. From the um, records of the cathedral choir itself, we know that Samuel was a tenor vocalist. He was lay clerk at Litchfield Cathedral. He was a zealous worker in the cause of music and an oratorio singer of repute in the Midlands. Okay, so he obviously had a lovely tenor voice. Not only did he sing in the cathedral choir, but he also was able to give recitals um, to in other parts of the Midlands. And I did find an article um, where he'd given a recital in at Wolver, over in Wolverhampton, and it was um, they were, were sort of saying how well he'd sung and waxing lyrically about how good he his his singing voice was, etc. So obviously he had a very very good voice. He also gave music lessons, also another way to supplement his income, he gave music lessons to, to people in and around Litchfield. And as we know, he was also a church warden of St Chad's. In 1851, he's living in 86 Beacon Street, so that's from the census records, he's living in 86 Beacon Street, which unfortunately doesn't stand anymore. It probably would have been near where the um, Cathedral Lodge Hotel is now, up that part, um, which is probably where 86 would have been. And we know that in 1881, he's now living in Stafford Road at Victoria Cottage, which is a rather lovely house near, just opposite where the um, fireplace shop is, just up there. So, yeah, so he stayed in, in, in and around Beacon Street, Stafford Road for all his life. And as I say, he was a chairman of the Pike Green Trust for a good number of years as well. And probably they um, he probably maybe had quite good... They could sing to the trust when they had their AGMs in one of the pubs. Who knows? Um, his children are quite interesting. He had two sons and three daughters. Um, his sons we can find a little bit about. Um, there's one son called John Cooksey Cullick, who stayed in Litchfield and became an ornamental and ecclesiastical wrought ironmaker. And he was responsible for doing the wrought iron work on top of the Garden of Remembrance. So here we've got the, the gates of the Garden of Remem Remembrance. And on top of this, we have this more ornate metalwork, which um, John Cooksey Cullick um, was responsible for doing. And it says Pax 1919 on the top there. And a little bit more zooming in and, and a bit more look at the detail. You can sort of appreciate the handicraft and the workmanship involved in making this ornamental ornamental part of the gate um so it's quite actually quite beautiful i don't know whether he did any of the metal work within the cathedral or not i, I don't know but most certainly you'd have thought that his work was of a good enough standard to have done that so he was yeah so he was hey, he was staying in lichfield um doing his metal work his, the other brother, he had a brother then, or another son of Samuel Cullick, um, Dr. James Cooksey Cullick, um, who followed more in his father's footsteps in that he started off by being a chorister at Litchfield Cathedral and later on he became the assistant organist at Litchfield Cathedral as well. But when he was 21, he then moved to Dublin and he then stayed there for the rest of his life. And he became quite a famous person in Dublin through his work in music, not only in his um, being able to be involved in choral music, but also in teaching music and also in doing research into Irish music as well. He wrote a couple of books on Irish music and he was quite a forefront in the methods and the teaching of music as well 
um, sort of the pedagogy associated with musical teaching. He became a doctor. This doctor here is an honorary doctorate, so he didn't do a PhD or, or medicine degree or anything. This is an honorary doctorate given to him by the University of Dublin um, in the late 1980s. And I think, again, you know, it shows the respect that he had gained in Dublin society, that he was awarded an honorary doctorate through his work and um, that, um, that he'd done through the establishment of the choral group that we'll talk about in a minute and um, his teaching. And he seemingly, he was also very much um, trying to get women to become professional musicians as well as a time when women probably didn't work professional musicians. You know, it was more of a recreational thing for women to do, but he was very much in the forefront of trying to encourage women to become professional musicians. And so in 1898, then he formed the Cullick Choral Society. And the Cullick Choral, Choral, can't say that. Cullick Choral Society is still going strong. Um, here we have their web page. They've got a, a web page. Um, you can follow them on Facebook, Twitter. Um, you can join them. If you lived in Dublin, you can join them. So they're still very active, still giving recitals. You can join them, I say. Um, and they look as though they're all having a good fun time. So, yes, yeah, so they're still going strong in Dublin. I think they're a very well-respected choral group within um, Dublin. And in um, 1998, there was a centenary year, so 100 years of the Cullet Choral Society, where they did highlights from Handel's Messiah, um, and it was recorded in the cathedral in Dublin. And here we have our main man himself. So we've got Dr. James Cooksey Cullick himself then, being celebrated for the hundred years of the choral society that he established. And I think, you know, we, we talk often about Samuel Johnson being the son of Litchfield, but I think um, Dr. James here also you know, deserves a bit more recognition than maybe we give. And I think he tends to be a, a forgotten son of Litchfield. And I think maybe we should try and make a bit more about him and his contribution to music um, than, than we do. But so yeah, so he's quite quite a interesting and uh, quite a famous famous son of Litchfield and of Beacon Street for that matter. Right, so moving on then, um, I just want to sort of switch tack a bit and talk about the pinners and the pinfolds. As I said at the beginning of the talk, I am the pinner of the Pipe Green Trust. We've, there's always been this committee member who is the pinner and we still keep it. The roles have changed slightly somewhat, but most certainly when the trust was formed, the pinner was somebody whose job it was to impound stray animals. So the pinner of the Pipe Green Trust would have uh, impounded any stray animals that were um, had gone astray from the green. Um, the pinner also of the Pipe Green Trust would have done a little bit more as well. The pinner would have also have checked that the cattle grazing on the green were the ones that were supposed to be there. Um, we do have evidence that some people were trying to sneak their cattle on the green without paying for them. Um, and there is this quite interesting um, entry into the accounts book um, of 1820, where we know that Mr. Richard Neville had to swear an oath before a magistrate, no less, um, that the cow he was grazing on the green belonged to him. So the trust took this all quite seriously, um, as saying it was quite well um, regimented, you know, that you only those that had paid their money were allowed to graze the, on the green. And saying the pinner at that time would have been made sure that the um, animals on the green were those that had been paid for. And I say Mr. Richard Neville then had to swear that this cow he was grazing belonged to him. It's all just quite amusing that he had to go before a magistrate and swear this. Um, which are um, quite different, I think, to what we do today. And we're lucky that um, the Pinners, well, the Pinners also, the city of Litchfield also had two Pinners they appointed. These were separate to the Pinners of, pin of the Pipe Green Trust. And also there were two pinfolds um, in the city as well. So we're lucky that the one in Stafford Road still exists. The other one was up in Green Hill, which unfortunately is no longer there. But the Stafford Road pinfold is still in existence and was restored in the 1990s um, through the generosity of the Conduit Land Trust. Um, I say it tells a, 
a little bit about the uh, the city council still appoints two pinners and the pin lock keepers to take charge of the pin fold. So basically, if you had any stray animals, the pinner would um, put them in the pin fold, keep them safe, um, but also when you wanted to have your cattle or your horse or whatever it was released, you had to pay a fine. So, you know, you had to pay some money to get your stray animal released back to you. So it's a bit like getting your car clamped today for illegal parking or whatever. You know, you have to pay a certain amount of money to get it released. So this was the same with the pinfold. If your animal was, was straying and it was put in the pinfold, you had to pay some money to get it released. And what is quite interesting is that the pinfold at the moment today is in Stafford Road, but that wasn't always the case. If we look on the Snape map of 1781, the pinfold is located here. So just to orientate you, we've got Gaia Lane here, we've got Shaw Lane here, um, going down to the cathedral here. Um, so up from Gaia Lane, coming up the hill, probably, I don't know, probably nearer the brow of the hill, I'm not quite sure, I've never quite measured the distance in any exactctness, but um, probably nearer the, to the brow of the hill, so again near where the cathedral lodges would have been where the um, pinfold would have been in 1781. I'd say much closer to the cathedral um, than it is today. I'm saying then later on in the 1800s it got moved down to Stafford Road. And we know that, um, say beautifully restored as well, um, and we know that it was in use um, probably, it was first, most certainly sort of in the um, early 1900s. This article by Reverend Jackson, this is a 1943 article, where he says the old pinfold still remains. This is the one in Stafford Road, but is rarely, if ever, used for original purpose. So in 1943, it wasn't really being used, but then probably people didn't have as much livestock in and around Litchfield as, as they did in the earlier on in the 19th century. Um, so it's really, if ever, used for its original purpose. Though in younger days, so he's talking now probably in the 1880s, something like that, it frequently contained horses, cattle or sheep which had been caught straying on the road and penned by the official pinner, Old Watty Bevin. So in the 1880s it was obviously still being used, but by the 1940s this had um, not, not so much. I say nowadays, hardly ever, I think. I don't think ever seen anything in there at all. But it's worth having just having a stopping and having a look at it as you drive past. I think it's a bit that we just all drive past without thinking about it, but it's quite nice just to have a quick look over the wall and just sort of imagine what it would have looked like sort of 100 years ago. Okay, so just moving on slightly, um, the Trust, as, as most organisations do, I suppose, had AGMs each year, um, and they had them in one of the many pubs that were in Beacon Street at that time. And as with most AGMs, um, committee members were elected, so your chairman, your pinner, treasurer, etc., were um, appointed and accounts approved, etc. So things that normally happen in most AGMs and things that we still do in our AGMs as well. We so obviously, we still do have an annual general meeting. And again, we do exactly the same as they did in the 1793 when the trust was established. However, what we don't always do is that sometimes when funds allowed, the AGM was followed by a meal and drinks. And as this was um, held in a the pub, there was plenty of beer on tap, I'm sure, and food could be easily provided. And quite often the, um, the, the landlord or the innkeeper was often the member of the Pipe Green Trust as well. So that was quite an incentive then to um, have your friends around or your fellow trust members around for a meal and drinks after the AGM. And just one pub I want to talk about. I'm not going to talk about all the pubs that the um, the trust used. We'd be here the rest rest of the rest of the evening, I think, a good few hours. But I'm just going to talk about one pub, um, the Little George, um, which is this building here. This is at the end corner of Anson Avenue. This is Beacon Street here. This is Anson Avenue. Um, now res obviously a residential house with an extension that was built on sort of in the 1970s or so. So this would have been the Little George as it was. And we have this lovely photograph taken in the 1960s, early 1960s, of what it looked like then. So here we have then just that one part of the building, of the present day building, door on this right hand side. This is a quite an interesting thing, I'll mention it in the next couple of slides. This is a wooden gate post um, 
that is on the side of the building. And you can see at the back here, this is quite an interesting photograph. This is we've got Prince Rupert Muse. They have already been built, so I say this is the early 60s. And you can also have this sort of tantalizing glimpse into the back garden. So it looks like a little bit of a bird bath there, and sort of having a little glimpse into the into the back of that house and the lovely garden that they had. And we have then an earlier drawing or picture a painting of what it looked like. Um, this I guess is probably 1940s, 1950s. Um, hey, here we got say the little George in here next door to the round shop, which um, I'm sure some of you probably remember. And here we've got two gentlemen. I don't know whether they're coming in or going out of the pub. Um, beer barrel being rolled up um, up the side here. Um, yeah, so just got the sign here of, of, of the little George. So it just gives you an idea of, of what it would have looked like um, sort of in the probably 1940s, 1950s. A little bit of a close-up again um, of that part of the of the building. I say in the we know in 1813 that the um, AGM was held in the Little George, and George Wilday was the innkeeper. He was also the uh, member of the Pipe Green Trust. So again, member of the trust being the innkeeper and the trust having its AGM in his pub. Um, Unfortunately, say so the George, Little George closed in the 1960s and when the license went to the um, Windmill Pub, which has also subsequently shut and, well, been pulled down for that matter as well. Um, but yes, yeah, so it's just a little nice feel of, of what, what Little George would have looked like. Again, we've got the gate post here. So this is the same post here on the end of the building, which um, we could see earlier on. And if you look in the present day building, this is still the same gate post here. So that gives you sort of an orientation of what it would have looked like um, at that point. So yeah, this this gatepost then is now this gatepost here. And this would have been the, the Little George. OK, so that's just given a little bit of a history of some of the buildings on Beacon Street. So now I just want to turn attention to uh, some more characters that were members of the Pipe Green Trust. And they're also market gardeners. Um, Living more in the Stafford Road end of of the of, of Litchfield, and I think this 1898 OS map is actually quite telling because it shows that um, so here we've got Beacon Street coming up here, um, Cathedral sort of just around here. You can just see a sign there saying right, saying their Cathedral, um, Beacon House is over here. So we're coming up. This will be um, Wheel Lane going into Grange Lane. Um, here we've got Abnels Lane going off here. So this is where sort of Morrison's is now going along. This is crossing Hand Lane and then going up Stafford Road here. So you can see then that this area here was very rural. There weren't any buildings. So going up past Lingcroft, up to the top here, past the old, old inn that we used to be up there. You know, this was all fields, orchards, pasture um, and hardly any buildings. So it had a much, much more rural feel than this part of Beacon Street. So basically sort of the, the the residential area sort of stopped basically at where Morrison's is and then the rest of it was very much more arable and agricultural and, and a rural feel. And there was one um, member of the Pipe Green Trust, a chap called George Fernihoff, who was a member of the Trust for many, many years. He um, died in 1914. He was 79 years old when he died, so he had a good old age. And he was a member of the trust pretty much for most of his life. So for a good sort of 50 years or so, he, um, even if not 60 years, I think he was a member of the Pipe Green Trust and grazing cattle on the green and helping out, sort of digging ditches and doing some work parties on the green as well. But I think this is a lovely description here um, by the Reverend Jackson. Um, so this is in a 1938 article in the Litchfield Mercury where he's recalling um, sort of 50 or 60 years ago. So he's talking again here about sort of the 1880s when George Fernihoff was living at the foot of Lincroft Hill. He was a highly successful market gardener and a dairyman. And we, we know he had a, had a dairy herd. And so he had a considerable milk round as well. Um, but then this lovely description here in front of his house, stretching in length to the old pinfold, which we've just talked about was a perfect forest of nearly all kinds of fruit trees and in the fruit season was a veritable blaze of gold, purple and red etc 
with the trees laden with plums, chiefly Victorias, damsons, pears, apples and other fruits. I think that just is a lovely picture. It just sort of you know, gives you the feeling of, of this big orchard um, near, up from the pinfold, going up to the pinfold, up Stafford Road there, um, full of um, all these different pear trees and plum trees, damsons, etc., you know, all these orchards um, with all these coloured fruits and very much say, a different feel to, to what we have up there today. And also, I mean, there are were also orchards coming in, up into Beacon Street as well. It wasn't just in the Stafford Road end. There were also orchards um, looking coming up in, into Beacon Street as well. So very much a, a fruit-producing part there of, of um, Stafford Road. And then the article continues, um, again, this, this is quite a evocative description here, I think, where his carts, this is George Fernihoff, his carts regularly journeyed weekly, loaded with greens, potatoes, and almost every kind of vegetable during the early hours of the morning to the black country towns, in all kinds of weather, with nothing more than candle lamps to light them. So you can just imagine... Um, Sort of four o'clock in the morning, this cart laden with vegetables, so a horse stamping in, in the early morning, in the cold early mornings, um, you know, with a cart attached to it, going down Stafford Road, off to Wolverhampton, off to Warsaw, to the black country towns to sell his um, produce. And say nothing more than candle lamps to light them. I think that is quite, quite an evocative scene that um, Jackson is picturing or painting there. And again, depicts the um how what early start these people had to have and long days as well because not only did they have to go to the black country towns they had to come back as well and we have then this image um of not of george but uh, this is his nephew ted fernihoff and um, this is from the cuthbert brown one of the cuthbert brown books this companion book to born in a cathedral city um he lived in one so this is ted fernihoff now living at 141 beacon street and here we've got this lovely picture of him. He's got his cart laden with cauliflowers. There's all these white the cauliflowers all sticking out. So as he's going along, everyone can see his, how many cauliflowers he's got and how beautiful they all are. Um, on this cart attached to his horse. And probably, again, something that his father would have done, or was not his father, his, his uncle would have done, you know, sort of 40, 50 years earlier as well. So that gives us quite a nice feel of, of what it would have been like. Whether he was still going to the black country, I don't know. Whether he was just supplying more locally in Litchfield, um, I, I don't actually know. But I'd say it's a lovely image then of, of Ted with his horse and cart and his, and his lovely cauliflowers. And we're quite lucky that um, there's a document um, which is involved in the sale of the Litchfield estates. Um, this, this was printed in 1888. And what it is, it's the land that... Um, of Litchfield owned, so the, the land that the Litchfield estates from Shugborough owned um, in 1888. And basically, from reading the document, it sounded like the, Litch, the, the Earl of Litchfield actually owned most of Litchfield at that point in time. So basically, he's selling a lot of the land that he's owning um, to people. And this is a sales document outlining the different lots and um, what's for sale. And it is quite a fascinating document. But what we have here then is um, two valuable freehold, freehold fields, um, Lot 154, Capital Market Garden and Meadowland. And here we have Mr. George Fernihoff here. He's um, using or renting three acres and he's paying £12.15 shillings for that on an annual amount. Um, and so it's quite a detailed document. So it tells us, you know, who's who's renting the land at the present time and how much they're paying etc and if you go through this document um you well you find quite a few entries of george for office he has here's quite a number of entries so here's another one for him he's let to mr george Fernihoff. this is a um he's got a building front it's just up the goodwill of water and a pump so it's a meadow land or it could be pasture land and here he's again three acres and he's paying 16 pounds per annum and if you go through this document and add up all the land that George was renting, um, it comes to an, quite an amazing 20 acres. So George was renting 20 acres of land, mainly this is all up Stafford Road, 
um, at a cost of £100. And if you equate that into modern day money, that amounts to £11,000 today. So this was quite a big business for George Whitney-Hoff. He had his orchards, we know he's got his orchards, we know he had a dairy herd as well, so he, obviously some of the land was used for cattle grazing, and he also then had a market garden business as well. So it's quite a big business that he had. You know, he wasn't just growing the old cabbage or the old cauliflower. Um, you know, this was quite a big business and must have been employing, you know, a good number of people out of thought, you know, from the local area to help him, you know, farm this land. Um, so, yeah, so one of the market gardeners of Litchfield, um, mainly working the land up Stafford Road. Now, another character um, that I just want to mention is Bill Gallimore. Um, he was again involved in the Pipe Green Trust. He was the chairman of the Pipe Green Trust for a number of years. And he also, as I mentioned earlier in this talk, he was renting from about the 1930s, he was renting the Pipe Green land itself. Um, so he was farming um, more, he was a farmer, he was farming more um, up towards the Maple Hayes estate. And in fact, I think he actually did farm the Maple Hayes land as well, some of it. So he's, he's William Gallimore, he's a farmer, um, he lived in Pinfold Farm and the Pinfold Farm is, um, I say, up Stafford Road. And what we know about him is an obituary then of 1949, so he died in 1949, he was 88 years old, so I think living in Stafford Road must have been quite good for you actually, because George Fernhill lived to a ripe old age, and you've got now Bill Gallimore being 88 years old, um, living in Stafford Road. So I think there's something up there that um, makes you, gives longevity. Um, but anyway, he was, it says in this article that he was a well-known market gardener and farmer, and he'd farmed in the Beacon Street district for upwards of 70 years. And before the war, he was a big cattle and pig era and winner, prominent prize winner at many of the Midland shows. So that's what we know, well, some of the things that we know about him. He's, he was a very well-respected farmer. He's often referred to as the John Bull of the farming. I've seen some articles of that where he's called the John Bull um, of Litchfield um, and say very well-known character of Litchfield. I say been in the area for 88 years. He, he was um, living, say, this is Pinfold Farm. It doesn't look much like a farmhouse, does it really? Um, and it doesn't look like a farmhouse because basically it was always two cottages. If you look on the um, ground here, we've got one entry here and a bit further down here is another entry. You can see there's another entry would have been here. So this was two cottages, quite simple cottages, sort of two up, two down cottages, um, which has now been made into one, one, one house. Uh, although it's obviously it was, it's still called the cottages. So, so Pinfold Farm would have actually been two properties. Um, and you can see a bit more clearly for this, sort of this angle that you know, here we've got the entry and here we've actually got, you see just on the plaster work and the rendering here on the wall, the, where the door entry would have been. So this was where Bill Gallimore lived. And I think his brother lived next door. I think both him and his, one of his brothers um, lived next door. And we have then this picture of him. So this is Bill Gallimore in the middle here um, with his two brothers. So he had two brothers who worked with him. So they all worked the farming business. And what is actually quite interesting about the Gallimores is that um, I always assumed that they came from farming stock, but actually that's not the case. Their father, um, the Gallimores' father, was actually a clockmaker. Um, he had a shop in Tamworth Street. So he, he was doing you know, something totally different, um, but then the three brothers, for whatever reason, um, decided to go into the farming business and um, started it themselves. So yes, yeah, so here we've got um, our Bill Gallimore here um, with his two brothers. One of them had a wooden leg as well. I can't remember which one it is, but one of them had a wooden leg. I don't know how he got a wooden leg, but he did have one. They also had three shire horses. So you've got two here, two shire horses here, um, tied up to the cart with laden laden again with cauliflowers so i think cauliflowers must have been sort of an exotic vegetable of the time actually and i think it was you know quite a showpiece to be a growing cauliflowers and and maybe they were more expensive to buy than obviously they were more expensive to buy than than cabbages but you've got some pretty good specimens there actually um but yeah so 
showpiecing your vegetable prowess by um, having cauliflowers on your on the edge of your of your vegetable wagon. Um, but yeah, so so as I said, the Gallimores then brothers um, working the land um, for a good eighty odd years, and so in Beacon Street, but then it's also going across to to the Maple Haze, and I say he also was using the pipe green land also for grazing um, as well. Right, so that's um, the what I want to talk about people. I just want to finish off this talk by looking at um, Pipe Green now as a recreational area. And, and what we know about historically, was it used as a recreational area or was it just really used for cattle grazing? So what, what can we tell about it historically um, in terms of recreation? What do we know about it? There are a few, few sources um, that I've managed to find out. I know that in 1817 there's an entry in the accounts books that um, George Dodson, Mr Dodson, played a, paid a guinea to pay, have, the, have the right to play cricket on the green, which is rather a, a, rather a um, brave thing to do, I think, actually. Um, 1817, I'm not a cricket fanatic, but I do, I, mean, I think as far as I know, that is um, quite early on in the history of cricket. So obviously he was a pioneering this, this new game. He was quite excited about it, played this new game, and he decided that the um, green might be a good place to do it. Um, he only did it for one year, so obviously I don't think it was that successful. Um, I think it would have been pretty rough and ready. I think probably a bit like as we depicted in this um, picture here, and probably not really like the game as we know it today. So probably quite a rough wicket, um, and um, just trying to <laughs> throw the ball around, try and hit it, and, and, and try and catch the ball, I think would have been what it would have amounted to. Um, what the cattle did on the green at that time, I don't know whether they were penned into a certain area or whether they were allowed to roam freely I, I, I don't actually know but um, the fact he only did it for one year sort of suggests to me that maybe it wasn't as successful as he had hoped and maybe he found somewhere else more suitable to um, play cricket but it's quite interesting that you know, early on 1817 they are using the green for recreational purposes. Also we know um, in 1892 there's a letter to the Litchfield Mercury, quite an indignant letter to the Litchfield Mercury, um, complaining about people playing football. Not so much that they're playing football on the green, but they're playing football on a Sunday, on the Sabbath. So there's rather indignant um, letters saying, um, we invite the opinion of, of the things of the public for, of the proceedings which take place on Pipe Green every Sunday morning and afternoon. Football and other games are indulged in, accompanied by much noise. It is very discreditable that sports be indulged in on the day of rest. So I think this is quite a, it's quite indignant um, that football is being played on a Sunday as opposed to football being played on Pike Green. But nevertheless, it gives us a little window to the fact that, you know, on a Sunday, people were going over onto the green. They were having a run around, kicking a ball around and... Having a, making a bit of a noise. And I think it's you know, important to appreciate that at that time, you know, there were limited areas in and around Litchfield where you could probably do that. You know, Beacon Park at that stage would have just been the museum gardens, you know, the very formal gardens. Um, you didn't have the area where the swings are now, where the football fields are, or let alone the golf course. Um, so, you know, if you wanted to run around, um, kick a ball around you, know, you couldn't actually do that in Beacon Park you had to go somewhere else and so obviously Pipe Green was an area where you went to um, particularly on a Sunday and had had a had a bit of a relax and a bit of a run around much of the indignation of um, some of the residents um, but yeah so times have changed this I'd be much more annoyed if people played football on the green today um, I don't care whether it's on a Sunday or not but I think um, I wouldn't really want people to be playing football on the green at all today also, we know that um, the green, particularly in the 20th century, was very popular, and, and before then as well, actually, in, in the 19th century as well, it was also popular for picnics and paddling. We have this article in the uh, Litchfield Mercury, which says Litchfield's Lido, um, where youngsters are paddling and bathing, question mark, in Pipe Green Brook during the recent hot spell. It's not a brilliant picture, I apologise for that. It is from the, from the Mercury. Um, and here we have then... The, the Lemonsley Brook here, quite a, quite a lot of children paddling here, having fun, having a splash, 
paddle in there and also on the edge of the edges you can see you know people also having picnics and just enjoying themselves and again I say it's it's reinforcing what i just said that you know the beacon park wasn't as we know it now um so if you wanted to go somewhere where you wanted a bit of a picnic and a bit more relaxing recreational time you know the green was an area where you would go to and just do that um and we have then say yeah so we have then so the area i'll say i do to be honest i still do have an odd paddle on a hot day it is quite refreshing to go and just take your your shoes and socks off and go and have a bit of a paddle in the green on on the in the stream at least um it is the water is actually quite cold um but it is quite refreshing to do that and i can understand why people actually came to the green and had enjoyed the the stream and had a paddle and a picnic and we have um uh, quite a but well, quite an amusing um, entry again by Reverend Jackson. This is in 1938, the article where he's reminiscing about um, going to the green as a child and what, what happened. So he's saying 70 years ago. So again, we're talking about 1870s, 1880s or so. Um, Pipe Green was the favourite playground of children. Okay, The language is quite amusing, actually. Um, it was a perfect Eden to the youngsters who sat on its luxuriant carpet of emerald verdure, in other words, grass, um, making daisy chains, dandelion necklaces, wreaths and bridal trains of brani, parasols from rushes, crowns of king cups, etc. Um, so, you know, again, people going over there, relaxing um, and having a good time is um, you know, what, what, the, what you're picking up from here. And also it's quite interesting from an ecological point of view, Briny, we don't have any briny on the green at the moment, maybe because it all got made into bridal trains, possibly. Um, king cups, we do have some, but not huge in number, so you wouldn't really be going and making a crown. So we do have some king cup, this is king cup here. Um, but yeah, so it's also quite interesting looking at this with an ecological hat on, saying, okay, some of these species we still have, some of them we don't. Um, but nevertheless, it's um, quite quite a poetic description of of how the green was enjoyed by children and and by adults as well i'm sure okay then another another thing that made me smile um is that people we obviously use the green for walking on as well for going for a lovely walk so here we have this letter um in 1884 where he talks about going to the green and have been a prettiest walk in the neighborhood of Litchfield so it's been used for walking and recreational use as it is used today a lot of people go on the green and walk across it to say go around Lemonsley Woods but what made me smile um, in this art letter here of 1884 was the fact that there was a um, board here saying that that had been um, noticed no road trespassers will be prosecuted so I don't know if people know much about the um in a few well for a few years we've had footpath disputes in the area for problems with um owners locking gates and not allowing access onto the public rights of way. We've had that a few times, um which um I've been actively involved in. And so this all sort of made me smile, the fact that sort of over a hundred years ago, um things were still the same. You know, there were still disputes over public football footpaths and, and, and things like that, where this um, person in 1884 is complaining that last Sunday he walked over Pipe Green and when he arrived at Mr Buck's house he was startled by seeing this hideous board, these ominous words on notice no road trespassers will be prosecuted. Can this be the thin end of the wedge to deprive the public of one of the prettiest walks in the neighbourhood of Litchfield? So that made me smile. He sometimes you know, sometimes you think that um, what you're dealing with is just new and nobody's ever had to bother with it before. But in fact, over 100 years ago, exactly the same things would happen, that things would have been um, locked or notices put up, which shouldn't have been put up. But yeah, so that made me that made me smile. And finally, it's just the, the last slide here. Again, gives us a bit of a feel of, of what the green was being used for. Um, again, this is by the Reverend Jackson. Um, Again, his article in 1938. Um, again, he's going back when he's first learned to ride on a pony. So here we're talking about 1870s, 1880s. Um, turned each evening to turn loose the pony onto Pipe Green after its day's work. Um, but this makes me laugh. Before taking off the halter, however, we mounted the steed and indulged in a canter or easy gallop 
and gradually became experts in jumping over the brook on its back. We experienced a few falls. How the pony felt is quite another matter. And I think that just gives quite a lovely, um, another window again of what was happening on the green. Basically, children were taking the pony onto the green, jumping on its back, having a bit of a hoolie around the green, having a bit of a cant, having a bit of a gallop and then trying to jump over the stream. Uh, yeah, I'll take my hat off to them on that, and I'm sure they, they did have a few falls, actually, but but um, hopefully hopefully they were sort of quite soft falls. Hopefully they were quite... I mean, the ground is quite wet there, so presumably the, the falls were quite soft. So I think that, again, that gives a nice little image, again, of, of the more of a personal use of the green, you know, people going there and, and just galloping their pony around it before taking off its halter. Okay, so that's um, all I've got to say uh, today. I hope you've enjoyed this virtual talk. I know it's a bit different to what you normally expect and hopefully um, next time it will be more of a face-to-face -face meeting that you can have. We do have um, a website, by the way. We do have a website here, pipegreentrust.org, um, which you're welcome to visit. Um, there's quite a lot of information. I put a monthly diary on up on, on the website um, to sort of just describe what's going on on the green on a monthly basis. There's also some history pages which, um, well, do need updating, um, but um, nevertheless have some information about the establishment of the trust. Also, for those of you who use social media, I've got a Facebook page and also a Twitter account, which can, again have updates of what things that might be happening on the Green Hall can be seen to be happening on the Green. OK, well, so thank you very much for your attention and saying I hope you found some of this interesting and um, thank you very much for, for listening to it all and goodbye.